Thank you uh, all for coming, and thank you for to Sally and Steve and Catherine and everybody for putting this whole thing together. It's really been an amazing uh, uh, adventure for us uh, to, to think about neuroscience and the future of it on campus here. So um, it's my role today, um, myself and Joe Bergen, to talk about uh, neuroendocrinology on campus and what it is and where, where our strengths are and what we're doing. And so um, in that capacity, I'm the current director of the Center for Neuroendocrine Studies. So uh, we'll just take you through a little bit about uh, what this discipline is. So neuroendocrinology is this integrative discipline itself because it integrates across neural circuits, hormones, and behavior and physiology. So it's really a, a nexus of a number of different uh, aims. And it spans across, researchers in the center span across these levels of analysis from molecular to environment. So it has a lot of different departments incorporated into the neuroendocrinology theme and a lot of different approaches. Um, so his, historically, this position of strength for neuroendocrinology at UMass uh, is due to this formation of the Center for Neuroendocrine Studies. And so we are in our 18th year on campus. Uh, we have approximately 18 faculty labs that uh, contribute to the center. And we have a, we are organized principally by a biweekly meeting where we uh, we call it hormones for breakfast, <laughs> and we got we discuss recent developments in the field. We have a, uh, a forum for for trainees to present their work and talk about uh, new grant ideas and new project ideas, and we also bring in outside speakers for this. Um, the group, as you'll see in a moment, we're making uh, continually a series of discoveries that I think are important for neuroendocrinology, but also for neuroscience on a broader sense, and I'll talk, we'll touch on those. And uh, we currently have active support from a number of federal agencies, strong support from NIH and NSF, uh, in addition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have two periods of prior training grant support, which has really helped us start the center and get the center uh, rolling, and uh, two large multi-institution uh, training grants, um, sorry, consortium grants from NSF and NIH. Um, so one of our real major contributions to the outreach mission of this land-grant institution is to uh, host a biannual symposium where we bring to campus five distinguished lecturers and they present uh, some of the recent uh, developments in the field around a, a theme. And uh, it's really turned into a regional meeting, a, re a, a northeast neuroendocrinology meeting. So it's been a very exciting uh, thing to be part of. Um, we do, the center itself has a, a fairly strong national and international reputation. So part of the attraction for some of us coming to UMass is this neuroendocrinology uh, strength here at UMass for both post postdocs and faculty members as well as graduate students. We see on our grant reviews actually that um, in an objective sense this comes back to us. So for example in the environment strengths are noticed as uh, a strong investment in neuroendocrinology. So that's something that, that external um, reviewers already uh, notice for. And I should note too that we're going through the process of, of a search for uh, this director for a uh, neuroscience initiative on campus right now in the, in the College of Natural Sciences. And six out of nine interviewees for this position noted that neuroendocrinology is really a significant strength and something to build on. Um, we have a number of international and national collaborations as represented by this map. So uh, collaborations between our campus and, and uh, campuses coming uh, people coming from other campuses to, to this campus and to give you an idea of the scope of these collaborations. So we've broken down the uh, neuroendocrinology on campus into sort of five themes to touch on and give you a sense of what we do in the, in the center and how we, uh, how our reach is uh, in these disciplines. So the first theme is on sex differences. So this is something that's a very important theme to neuroendocrinologists for a long time. So how does the brain differentiate into male versus female? And what does that mean for understanding neurobiology? Um, in addition to sort of empirical work on this topic, we have a number of people that are experts that are weighing in in editorials and in, in reviews on how important this topic is to uh, the, the neuroscience writ large. And in fact, our own Annalise Beery published a very influential review in Nature in 2010 showing that while there are a number of disorders that are biased towards women, in, in uh, particularly in neuro neurological disorders, the, ma the studies that are conducted at the preclinical level and animal studies are biased towards males. And so that was a real call to action in the field. Um, this call was taken up by uh, individuals in the center through editorial comments, through reviews, 
through policies at journals to say this can't be uh, a standing uh, policy going forward. We need to have changes in the policy. And so that meant that we need to acknowledge what the sex is of our studies, how uh, there may be biases in our own studies to make sure uh, we understand whether there's a male or, or female <coughs> bias. And this has uh, in part led the field uh, to, in fact, influence policy at NIH. So the NIH, uh, June of last year, released a policy that sex needed to be tr treated as a biological variable. So you can no longer ignore the sex of your, um, your study organism, whether it be a cell line or an, a whole animal perspective or a human population. You need to understand what the differences are between males and females. So this is something that the center is really interested in. There's a lot of empirical research on this topic, and sex differences has now become very important for neuroscience in, in the mainstream. Um, the second theme that we have here at UMass is one of, of stress. So we're interested in how stress affects uh, at a whole, whole organism perspective. Um, so in 2008, uh, Jeff Blaustein and Sally Powers started a stress uh, working group in, that is brought together clean, uh, pre, uh, sorry, excuse me, basic scientists and clinical scientists together to talk about the particular strengths of understanding stress during early development. And so it's really an interesting meld of human researchers and animal researchers together trying to find common ground, trying to find a, a language to talk about how stress manifests in a variety of, uh, of experimental conditions. This has then led to, on uh, the efforts of, of Lynette Sievert, has led to a tra training proposal being submitted last week on getting graduate students and postdoctoral training in understanding how to study and be certified to understand stress from a perspective of both human and animal uh, side of, of, the, of the aisle. So the impact of this group on stress is substantial. In fact, UMass has become a hub for understanding uh, analysis of biomarkers of stress for tissues such as, in addition to the classical ones, plasma, but also hair, uh, fingernail clippings, things like this that you might not tra traditionally think about in terms of how you analyze uh, markers for how they're impacting the central nervous system. One quick illustration of this is a study that just came out recently from uh, in the individuals in the center that actually in, in investigated this nutritional stress in polar bears and found that, in fact, polar bears are uh, exposed to climate change, as we all know, and one objective measure of this is, uh, is stress in their uh, hair. And so this is actually influencing uh, policy in, on climate change and interfaces with the UMass um, strength in climate change research. So uh, the third theme I wanted to touch on here with the neuroendocrinology theme, uh, sub-theme here, is one of biological rhythms. And this is a, a very important um, theme in that it's in keeping with the, the first two that neuroendocrinologists are now understanding that we need to pay attention to not only differences between males and females, how our animals or, or study uh, participants may be in, engaged in stress, but also the time of day and the time of season that these studies are being conducted in. So these are really important issues that are becoming uh, more and more increasingly important to the broader discipline of neuroscience. So here we have particular strengths in molecular and neural basis for biological rhythms and how they impact uh, disease. And for example, this work going on in Eric Fittman's lab uh, in a hamster model has discovered a mutation, a spontaneous mutation that protects the brain from the effects of what you might call jet lag in an animal model. So these animals are no longer showing uh, long-term uh, or, or sh short changes in their photo period. Uh, that are that are reflecting uh, changes uh, that we that are consistent with jet lag, and so they're hot on the trail for how to identify the genetic underpinnings of this and the neural circuit and hormonal underpinnings of this. So it'll be interesting to to see that, not only because from a basic bi biology standpoint, but also because biological rhythm disorders impact a variety of uh, very uh, devastating diseases, including these that are up here on the left. So this sub theme is also has as an important point of contact with our colleagues at the UMass Medical School um, who are engaged in, in biological rhythms research. So it's been a longstanding uh, point of contact for this campus and the, and the medical, school, medical school campus. Uh, the, the fourth theme, sub-theme here is one of environmental variables and factors. So there's a significant presence on campus of individuals interested in how the environment plays into and, and affects the endocrine system and the central nervous system. And so in particular, this work in, it focuses on environmental, environmental contaminants that may impact uh, the brain and behavior. So for example, Tom Zeller's work 
uh, early on had, had really developed some very interesting work on how uh, rocket fuel and other and flame retardants, in fact, can impact thyroid hormone function and can change uh, pregnancy outcomes. And so that that is that was a, a lot good deal of empirical work on this topic that led to policy changes. So um, Tom's uh, and others' work on this topic has really led to changes in policy at the level of the APA. Um, so researchers in this domain have had a profound effect on, yeah. Is there really rocket fuel? Is that the word? <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. Hopefully not. But there, there are contaminants from rocket fuel that, are, that end up in drinking water that now need to be, that are, are being regulated now because of this work. So yeah, but don't let your drinking water on fire. <laughs> so we have, um, we have our last theme is one in, in neuro, neuroendocrinology is neuromodulation. And so this is the idea that there's particular strengths here at UMass in the understanding of how not only is the, is the brain a target of steroid hormones and other hormones, so circulating hormones in the plasma, but there are hormones that are being produced within neural circuits in the brain itself that are regulating brain function and behavior. So we come to understand this from a variety of perspectives. Uh, David Mormon has a series of projects on the, the synthesis of a small peptide in the hypothalamus called a rexin that regulates things like cognitive decision making and sleep-wake cycles. And there's a particular strength here in understanding the role of the brain as supplying its own estrogens. And this is not just a female thing anymore. This is now something that's occurring in both males and females. So the brain has the synthesis capacity, the enzymes that are making estrogens, and we now have come to understand that that's happening in a very fast time scale, very localized, uh, to change cognitive and other sensory processing. So it looks like um, estrogens are behaving somewhat similar to traditional neuromodulators like you would expect dopamine and serotonin to. So this makes it a real prime target for future development of neurotherapeutics, and so we've become very interested in, in its role. Um, I wanted to delve in a little bit into this in more detail because of an ongoing collaborative experiment um, with my lab and with Agnes Lacruz's lab, who's working on the marmoset. And this is, of course, the lunar, the first uh, lunar day today is, so uh, this is the year of the monkey, so it's uh, appropriate as well. <laughs> so uh, this is a marmoset model, which is a non-human primate model. It's a, very, it's a small, uh, hardy uh, captivity animal species. And Agnes uh, Lacruz has developed a very um, robust program looking at this from the whole animal perspective. And so one of the ideas that we're testing right now is that there's a class of anti-cancer drugs that's actually involved in suppressing uh, the synthesis of estrogens in the body. And what we've come to understand now is, of course, this can be impacting the, the central nervous system's ability to synthesize estrogens as well. So uh, this, this could have profound implications. In the clinical literature, there's reports of people on this class of drugs reporting a cognitive fog. And so we've become very interested in how this may play out in an animal species. So um, in this ongoing experiment, we're able to uh, look at the effects of this anti-cancer drug that's suppressing production of estrogens in the brain on cognitive tasks. So these animals are able to execute um, highly, uh, highly complex cognitive tasks. Uh, we're able to measure the levels of their estrogens in brain tissue. And we're able to, in the same uh, experiment, uh, in vitro examine the neural firing properties of their uh, cells in the hippocampus. So we're able to really integrate across these levels of analysis in one animal model to understand whether there are true uh, profound effects of this class of anti-cancer drugs on uh, cognition, uh, estrogen function, and, and the physiology of their neurons. Of course, as this story unfolds, here uh, in the year of the monkey, we will then be able to understand whether uh, there are some new directions and we can collaborate with potential translational scientists and, and uh, scientists at UMass Med to really help us understand the, the next step of this kind of research program. Um, and uh, individuals in the center are taking this theme and in fact having uh, policy um, and outreach um, aspects of this. Uh, for, for example, in the An American Cancer Society has a blog uh, run by Jeff Blaustein that asks questions like, well, are there in fact um, uh, reports of this in the, in the human side of things? So these are the, the five themes, sub-themes and areas within uh, neuroendocrinology that I wanted to focus on. And the future of neuroendocrinology will really continue to rely on new technologies and, and capacities. And so in this end, I wanted to turn things over to Joe Bergen, who's going to tell us about some exciting new directions that are available to us in this discipline uh, and share about his own work that, that 
want to make sure that you guys get a chance to see. So then we'll, I'll be right back after Joe's. <laughs> so understanding the behaviors and processes that Luke was just talking about really represents a formidable challenge. And uh, while I think there's a lot of differences between a computer and a brain, um, maybe the analogy between these two is useful in understanding these challenges. So in the case of, of the computer, people design the schematics that underlie all of these functions, so we can rely on that information to understand how the computer works. We don't have that information for the brain, so if we want to understand how neural circuits underlie behaviors, we first need to figure out what those neural circuits are. Essentially, we have to reverse engineer them. So if you ask you know, a behavioral neuroscientist like myself how particular brain functions are, are mediated, you often get an answer that looks something like this. For example, sensory input is transformed into behavior through a series of you know, linearly connected brain regions. All of us know um, that the situation is a lot more complicated than that, that there's many brain regions involved. We also know that in any one of these brain regions, there's a wide variety of, of cell types, genetically defined or anatomically defined cell types, and each one of these cell types contributes something unique to the overall circuit function. So <clears throat> the project that I want to talk about today aims to understand these neural maps that mediate behavior and to do that with four goals in mind. The first is to get something like a brain-wide connectivity map, to do this with cellular resolution, to have genetic specificity of the circuits that we're studying, and also to use this information to better understand the, the strengths of connections between two distinct populations of neurons. Now, the cells that I've, I've been working on most recently are the aromatase expressing cells in the brain. And um, while it's well known on this campus, it actually comes as a surprise to most people to learn that um, the brain is a major producer of hormones. Um, these aromatase cells produce estrogen in the brain. And uh, we know that's really important for social behavior. We also know it's essential for setting up the sexually dimorphic circuits that underlie these behaviors. Now, to get access to the aromatase cells, we rely on conditional genetics in the mouse. And we also use viral strategies to express proteins we're interested in subsets of these neurons. For example, we can now use viral tracing strategies to uh, fluorescently label all of the neurons that provide direct synaptic input to a particular population of, of neurons that we're interested in. In this case, this would be the aromatase expressing cells of the medial amygdala. Now, even if we can label uh, entire circuits, fluorescently label entire circuits uh, in vivo, we still have a, a very obvious problem, and that's that the brain is opaque. So you can see this is what a mouse brain looks like here. What this means is that we don't have optical access to the cells that are in the center of the brain. Um, typically, in the past, people have dealt with this by sectioning the brain very thinly. Um, of course, the process of sectioning the brain uh, breaks the relationship between cells that are on different sections. Uh, over the last five years, I would say, a variety of techniques have come online. Uh, but instead of sectioning the tissue, take the tissue and render it transparent. And all of these techniques rely on matching the refractive index of the tissue to the refractive index of the media that you're imaging in. Okay, so you can see there's an entire mouse brain here, and there's at least a full mouse brain there. Uh, once we've rendered the tissue clear, we have optical access anywhere in the tissue. Okay. So when we put these two techniques together, we're now able to image fluorescently labeled cells uh, very deep into the brain, actually straight through the brain. And I'll, I'll show you a movie of what this looks like now. Um, this movie starts near the surface of the brain, and then each frame will take you one step deeper into the brain. Um, I, and I think at the end, you'll end about three millimeters into the brain. That's about the center of a mouse's brain. 
Now, the neurons that are labeled in red are the aromatase expressing neurons, and the neurons that are labeled in green are the neurons that provide synaptic input to these cells. So let's see if I can get this playing. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <clears throat> so what I hope you see um, when you, as you watch this movie is that even as we go deeper and deeper into the brain, we still maintain pretty good resolution of the cells that we're looking at. So you can make out cell bodies, but you can also make out the individual uh, fibers that connect these cells, the axons and dendrites. Uh, even when we get all the way into the middle of the brain, we can still make out these processes. So we have good resolution of the whole brain. The other thing that's worth noting about this movie is that the image that you saw, or the speed at which you saw this movie, is about the same speed that we acquire the data at. So we rely on light sheet microscopy, which is very fast, and it means that we can generate large amounts of data very quickly. And the next uh, handful of slides I'll devote to, to explain how we handle uh, these data sets. So often a single brain will be several terabytes. So the first thing that we did uh, was take 20 unlabeled brains and we just imaged them. And then we morphed them onto each other and averaged them together and made an average brain, an average brain or an average reference brain. We use this um, each time we collect a new data set and we just register that new data set onto this reference brain. And in the process of doing this, what we have now is every new data set shares a coordinate frame, right? We also went in to the, to the reference brain and we annotated um, about 200 brain regions um, and made an atlas of, of the brain. So this is essentially an enormous paint by number project. It took much longer than I expected, but we have it done now and it's a one-time investment. And what it buys us is now each time we find a neuron in our new data set, we instantly know um, what brain region it's associated with. So putting all of these tools together, we're now able to, to generate uh, data sets that look like this. Um, and what you're looking at is about 30,000 neurons that provide direct synaptic input to aromatase expressing cells uh, in the medial amygdala. Um, each dot here represents one neuron, and the color of the dot uh, tells you what brain region uh, that neuron is in. So to recap, um, we were, were able to use imaging and genetic and viral strategies to focus in on, on particular cells that we're interested in. In the talk that I just gave, the medial amygdala aromatase expressing neurons. And we can use these strategies to better refine the circuit map. My hope is that strategies like this will first just help us better understand how circuits mediate behavior one of my particular interests is to understand how these circuits differ between different individuals. For example, young versus old, male versus female, or perhaps in the case of, of uh, brain disease. So we'll, t we'll take questions at the very end, if you don't mind. And I know there's probably a lot of questions for, for Joe. And uh, we've got a five-minute warning, so I'll, I'll zip through this. Part of this process is, is making sure we're looking in the mirror. It's a strategic planning process. So what are the challenges ahead for us here uh, in our neuroendocrinology theme and in the, in the broader sense of neuroscience? Uh, so some of the challenges ahead are that we have this uh, training grant mechanism that has supported the center for a long time, but now we need to think about how we're going to renew that. What's our best strategy forward to really make this uh, happen? We uh, are interested in developing some assessment cores uh, in concert with uh, IELTS because of there's some specific needs for developing high, um, high quantification and uh, 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 for things like hormones in brain tissue and behavior. Uh, we need to develop and prioritize some translational collaborations. So those of us that are interested, as Joe mentioned and I've mentioned, in estrogens in the brain, there are, for example, some uh, pro drugs that are on, available now in the, in the science community that can actually affect uh, brain estrogen specifically and not peripheral uh, markers. And we need to build on our and, and expertise and interface with UMass Med because there's a particular strength there in neurodegeneration and some of these molecules that we're talking about today are in fact 
highly, highly neuroprotective and can act as uh, very good targets for the future. Um, and we need to think out how best to uh, concert our efforts in building our, our strength in neuroendocrinology here in terms of hiring uh, and recruitment. So why invest, before I finish up, why invest in neuroendocrinology? Uh, well, first of all, sort of the rest of neuroscience is catching on. I hope you've gotten the sense that um, sex differences, uh, stress, the brain's ability to produce its own supply of things like hormones and neuromodulators, uh, biological rhythms are becoming very, very important for the broad discipline of neuroscience, and so we're, we're uh, hoping to uh, lead the way there. Um, we have individuals here that provide expertise on how to assess realistically the, the uh, uh, the way that peripheral markers can impact uh, CNS function and so and uh, vice versa. And we have the opportunity to develop the first REU site, uh, NSF REU site for neuroendocrinology in the, in the country. So that's something we're having discussions with in, in NSF. Um, and I think this theme is really at the heart of sort of the integrative approach of the proposed institute that um, is part of the strategic plan. So uh, going forward, it'll be interesting to, to develop that. And lastly, as you just saw, we have some very uh, intriguing and, and exciting new opportunities for technology that can uh, <coughs> develop our questions. So um, thanks for, for thinking about neuroendocrinology and neuroscience today, and we're happy to answer any of your questions. you have the circuit, then you can also go into different nodes, right, and maybe manipulate the activity of genetically defined cells and start to causally test the predictions, right? Does activity in this population of neurons affect circuit function and behavior the way we think it should? So, but yeah, I agree, it's a, it's a start, but I think it's an important start. Uh, just a question with respect to the inputs. Um, <coughs> How do you differentiate between the strength of an input, and is it possible that you have important inputs that are below detection level that would be missed by this approach? I think it's definitely a possibility. Um, there are strategies like GRASP that I, I've thought about using to try to actually test the strength. So this is a, a, a strategy that reconstitutes GFP across a synapse. But I think that might tell us something about the strength of connections. Um, a couple of people are just starting to try that. Um, when I say strength of connections, I really mean the numbers of cells that are inputting from one brain region to the other. So that's the level I'm at. But there's definitely a chance that we're missing some cells. So on one of your slides, you mentioned about recruitment. So with recruitment, um, in 10 years, what do you think the group can achieve? Now, what big ambition that you can achieve? Well, one thing we have now can is... Can you repeat the question because we can't hear it. So, um, maybe this is not on. So the question was, so um, with respect to recruitment, what's the, the eventual 10-year goal of, of, of the group? How can, what can we achieve in 10 years? And I think that's a really important question. It's something that we need to continue to, to think about. Um, you know, at this point, the center has, been, has arisen sort of by accident in some ways. It's, it's, a, it's a conglomeration of faculty that, it, that were hired in various departments without an overall hiring strategy in neuroendocrinology per se. It's just that at, at one point along the road, Jeff Blasta and others realized, well, we have a, a really strong group here. We're starting to get reputation outside in the field, so how can we build that? And so um, the group is particularly focused on these thematic areas, but that doesn't even cover all of neuroendocrinology. So there are areas such as uh, energetic balance and, and feeding that we don't really cover very well at all. So there are areas to build within neurotechnology, and I think there are areas to build within individuals like Joe who come in and are not necessarily card-carrying neurotechnologists, but come in and say, I actually have this new technology that can bring to bear on your questions and can really help you answer these, some of these long-standing questions in the field. So those would be strategies that I would, that would, I would deploy to make sure we have a robust training environment for our students through some of these grant training mechanisms, but also to think about how we can make sure neuroendocrinology uh, incorporates the new, new technologies. <laughs>